I've got not one, not two, but three Surface laptops here. And if you came to the live stream the other day, then you know that I already unboxed those. Those are empty boxes. Don't worry, they're safe. These are good looking machines. And if you saw my battery test, you know that this is the longest lasting machine that I've tested in a real world battery test. And it happens to be the Surface Laptop 7 with the X Plus chip, not even the X Elite. And I've also tested this one, which is the Surface Laptop 6 with the Intel Core Ultra 7 165H. Now it didn't last very long in a battery test, but today I'm gonna do a bunch of tests on all three of these and see how they do. I've already spent more than a week with this one, uh, just doing some coding tasks on it, casually using it, not for video editing. No, I wouldn't do that. I got my MacBook Pro for that, but I'm definitely liking the experience so far. It has a very nice aluminum premium feel. And I initially during the live stream, I've had a couple of problems with this touchpad. Editor Alex jumping in here. I still once in a while have a problem with this trackpad. And I don't know why it's totally intermittent and it only lasts for a few seconds. Now it must just be a bad unit because this one has zero issues. The keys on these things are fantastic. I've got windows. Hello on all three of these. Let's see how long that takes to uh, pop them all open. Come on, come on. No, no, not you. How about you? How about you? No. It works all the time when you have only one machine in front of you. Let's be realistic. Now the two new machines have pretty narrow bezels. You can see that it's much narrower than the previous generation, which is the Surface Laptop 6. Putting these together, there isn't much of a difference in the height of these things. They also both have a touch screen. Both touch screens work quite well. I feel like the new one works a little bit better. It's more responsive. The keyboard is different. The older keys have more of a thud to it and the newer keys are more clicky which I kind of like. And of course, a huge difference in the trackpad. The new trackpad has haptic feedback, which feels really nice, doesn't require that much force, and it works equally well everywhere on the trackpad, whereas the older one is a diving board trackpad. So it works well down here, but it doesn't work at all up here. Physically, the older, the new one have the MagSafe-like charging port, but the new machines have an extra USB-C port. So headphones, USB-A and two USB-Cs, while the older one has headphones, one USB-A and one USB-C. Also, the new Snapdragon ones came in these fancy boxes. Remind you of anybody? Yes, they're trying to basically copy Apple. Why are you copying Apple, Microsoft, huh? Well, I think that's pretty obvious. Apple's MacBook Airs have been a huge hit, so why not? Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Now, after my exhaustive battery test on these, I plugged them all in to recharge them. And from being dead, they drew slightly different amounts of power while being charged. Here's how much power they each drew after being dead and plugged in. As far as screen reflectivity, the older laptop is a little bit less reflective than the newer ones. The newer ones are just like mirrors almost. And because this is not a sponsored video, I, I bought all these machines myself. I can include comparisons to MacBooks. Shh. Yes, this video is not sponsored, but I want to acknowledge the members that support this channel. Thank you so much members. And if you want to join, there's a join button right down below. Back to the show. The MacBook does have some reflectivity, but it's not even close to how reflective the new laptops from Surface are, or even the old one. I can see myself clearly in these new laptops, but not so much in the older two. And by older two, both the laptop Surface 6 and the MacBook Air M3 both came out this year too, just earlier this year. Now I've got a couple of monitors on this desk. Let's see how they work with these laptops. I'm gonna plug them in one at a time. So far the X Elite has recognized that there's a monitor plugged in and there it is, it's showing up. No effect in scrolling or performance that I'm seeing. And I'm only checking the usability of these things right now. Not any kind of in-depth analysis of performance based on whether the monitor is plugged in or not. Just the user feel. Both monitors are not plugged in using USB-C to DisplayPort. And I'm not feeling any degradation in scrolling or navigating or anything like that. Now the X Plus is supposed to also work the same way. Unlike Apple that limits um, 
the number of monitors you can plug into the M3 or the base models compared to the M2 Pro or the M3 Pro or the M3 Max, these machines don't seem to do that. And this one doesn't suffer from any lag either. Now with laptop six, I only have one USB-C plug. Seems to work quite well. What if we use a little Thunderbolt 4 dock? I'm gonna start with laptop Surface 6 to see if there's an on-chip limitation or just a physical limitation. Okay, well, looks like it's not an on-chip limitation. It's just a limitation of having one USB-C port. And I've got both monitors now, both 4K monitors running from the laptop 6. However, this is a Thunderbolt 4 dock. Since there are no Thunderbolt ports on the new X Elite and X Plus machines, will docks like these work on them? Let's plug it in to find out. It's recognizing the dock, yes. It does work, and I'll link to this dock down below. It's my favorite little travel dock. So far, it's worked with pretty much everything I plugged into it. Now, it's hard to tell about the brightness of these things. They're very close, but just to make sure, I'm gonna check. None of the Surface laptops allow me to go all the way down to zero as far as brightness goes. So here's the X Elite results. We've got 1.9 as the lowest brightness, and then 535, which turns out to be the brightest screen out of all these. We got very similar numbers on the X Plus machine. Here's the Intel Surface Laptop 6, not very bright. And finally, yes, we get those deep, rich blacks with the MacBook Air, but only 456 nits compared to 535 on the Surface Laptop 7. Next, we're gonna see how long it takes for all these machines to start up using Schwarzenegger 2.0. When I push that red button over here, all these little fingers are gonna go down and turn on the switch. Let's do it. <laughs> yes. Oh, the Intel machine, the Surface Laptop is already on the desktop. Surface Laptop 6, then MacBook. MacBook is on the login screen because it doesn't have Face ID yet. These two turned on at the same time, but significantly slower than the MacBook or the Surface Laptop 6. And if I sound disappointed, um, I kind of am. It's okay. I have feelings. I'm not a robot like this thing. Let's start digging in a little bit more. And we're gonna start with memory speed because that's important. And there is a huge difference between the speeds of laptop six and laptop seven. Let's take a look. CPU Z reports laptop six has a frequency of 3391 megahertz. And the new systems, laptop seven, both are around 8,400 mega transfers per second with the new memory LPDDR5. And Apple's M3 is also at 6,400 mega transfers. Wait a minute, megahertz, mega transfers? What the heck is that? Why are they different? Mega transfers per second is roughly equivalent to megahertz, but it counts both the rising and falling edges of the cycle. That's the clock cycle. So in your mind, when you're converting megahertz to mega transfers, you wanna double the score, basically. When you double the laptop six's frequency, you, you get about 6,700 mega transfers, which is actually less than the laptop seven, significantly less. In fact, the laptop sevens both have really fast latest RAM, faster than the M3s. Now, speed is not the only thing you should care about with memory. Memory bandwidth also plays a big role, especially with AI applications. I know you're probably sick of hearing about AI, but it matters nowadays. You want fast speed with lots of bandwidth. The memory bandwidth on some of the top of the line Nvidia cards is huge, and that's what helps it be so fast to doing machine Machine learning tasks. Well, the only common way I could find comparing memory bandwidth on all these machines is the standard stream benchmark. So here's the bandwidth on the new Snapdragon machines. As far as bandwidths go these days, it's just okay. And the laptop 6 DDR5 memory bandwidth is not that far behind, although it is the lowest. But the bandwidth on the M3 is quite a bit faster, reaching over 96,000 megabytes per second on copy operation, compared to the X Elite's 60,000 megabytes per second. Now I'm going to build VS Code. Yes, the editor, I'm gonna build it. I'm gonna use measure command on the PCs and the time command on the Mac to get the timings of this operation. All right, these are all building now. And the only one making noise is the Intel machine. Pretty obvious. Let's take a look at the temperature there. We are at 35 degrees on the Intel machine, 34 on the X Plus and 35 on the X Elite. Funny that the X Plus and the X Elite are the same temperature, but they're not making any noise. MacBook Air just finished, that was at 31 degrees. So the total seconds on the X Elite, 89.9, X Plus 95.7, Intel 101.8, and 
63 seconds over here on the M3 MacBook Air. Let's do a quick battery check here because the Intel machine just gave me a warning about low battery. It's at 6% right now. I had to plug it in. The X Plus machine is at 44% and 46% on the X Elite machine. MacBook Air went down quite a bit to 26%. I'm not counting the MacBook Air here because I started less than 100% on that one. But now that the Intel machine is plugged in, we'll be able to see how much of a difference this build makes. And <laughs> it doesn't really that's surprising to me in fact these numbers are so close 101.8 seconds while not plugged in and 101 seconds 0.5 while plugged in. Now let's get even more nitty gritty, shall we? I've got some C++ code here and I have a quick sort that's a single core operation. And I also have a merge sort that's a multi-core operation. Now the easiest way to get C++ building on a Windows machine is to install Visual Studio, which I have done. And when you wanna build on the command line using Visual Studio tools, but you don't wanna open up Visual Studio, you just wanna do a C++ compilation, you can run something called a developer command prompt. But be careful here because if you open up the standard developer command prompt on a Windows for ARM machine, it's going to run all the x64 binaries instead of the ARM binaries. In order to run ARM binaries, Visual Studio 2022 for ARM gives you a native command prompt and you can search for it by saying ARM64 and be careful here, there's ARM64 underscore x64 cross tools command prompt and there's the native tools command prompt. You want the native one if you want to build for ARM64, and you want the regular one if you want to build for x64 or x86. <sighs> I know. So I built the quick sort program, and it's going to sort 10 million integers. It's pretty small, but we're only using one core, so it's gonna take a significant time. Not a long time, but a significant time. And if I run the program that I built using the ARM64 underscore x64 cross tools command prompt, that just rolls off the tongue so nicely. If we take a look at the task manager, you'll see that it's an x64 program running there. Main.exe is x64. But if I use the ARM native tools command prompt and I run that one, you'll see that that one is an ARM64 process. So which one is faster on an ARM machine? Well, come on. It's the ARM one, right? But how is the X64 one even running on an ARM machine? Well, Microsoft included something called Prism, which is a translation layer that's similar to Rosetta 2 on Macs, and it'll run your X64 and X86 programs without too much impact, so they say. Let's measure how long it takes to run the executable that's built for X64. 5.79 seconds. And now we'll measure the other one, the ARM one. 6.5 seconds, it's slower, what the heck? <laughs> I did not expect that. Trying to prove a point here and it's not cooperating. Something weird is going on because I expected it to be uh, that the ARM one was faster, but it's actually slower. Prism is doing too good of a job? It's obviously something else going on here. If you know the answer, put a comment down below. I'm sure everybody would appreciate it. Let's do this bigger compilation now, which is the multi-core sort, the merge sort. And this one is doing 1 billion numbers. The X64 one first. Now we see a difference. And for the X64 one, going through Prism translation, we got 153 seconds total. And for the native ARM one, 85.8. That is a big deal. The previous X64 to ARM translation layer, whatever it was called, I think it was still called Prism, but it wasn't advertised as such, was terrible. This one is much better, but it's still not as good as Microsoft announced. It's almost two times slower to run this multi-core merge sort. Now, I also tried to run this here on our Intel-based machine, but this one would not even compile because, well, it didn't like the size of the array. So the compiler caught it before I even got a chance to run it. Now, I do also have a result for our MacBook Air. And the same exact run over there took two minutes and 58 seconds. Huh, why is that? Well, the X Elite and X Plus machines have 12 cores and this is a multi-core operation. So multi-core operations like this will be faster on the X Elites than the eight core M3 processor. Well, I took away a zero so we can run this on all the machines now. And I'm gonna run the native code for all these machines and let's see uh, what we get. I'm really curious about the difference between the X Elite and the X Plus here. It is actually faster on the X Elite. 6.9 for the first run, 6.5 seconds for the second run. 7.5 and 7.5 pretty consistently on the X plus we've got 6.69 on the Intel machine 
6.39 for the second run. Fastest one so far. And the slowest one on the MacBook Air, 15.1 and 15.0 for the second run. And different compilers and different flags and optimizations will create different results like these. However, I use the same compiler on all the PC machines. And just because I know you're gonna ask, here are the flags that I used on the Mac. And I know the C++ experts out there are gonna yell at me about this. Or maybe not yell, maybe just correct me. My curiosity was satisfied about the X Elite being a little bit faster than the X Plus, but the Intel machine was faster than both of them by a little bit. And if you're curious, unplugging the Intel machine does yield slower results by a tiny bit. I just ran two more with it unplugged. We've got 6.75 and 6.74 compared to 6.39 plugged in. So now that we've seen how Prism is going to address compatibility between x64 software running on your ARM architecture machines, this was for a really simple demo. How will this affect real software out there? Because remember when Apple first launched Apple Silicon, they gave developers a long time to get their software ready. They had a dev kit that they shipped out months in advance before they even released the first machines. I think the Snapdragon dev kits will be here soon i hope but we already have real machines what are developers supposed to use who bring their apps up to speed that's that's not what we're talking about in this video we're talking about actual things in this video actual things that we already have and what we have is a bunch of applications that do run on arm natively visual studio being the big one for developers chrome intellij pycharm vs code notepad plus plus yes notepad plus plus one of my favorite uh, editors takes me way back nostalgia Docker, anything running inside WSL2, Python for Windows, Node.js, Postman, and of course, Power Toys. These are just some of the things I use. There's enough stuff out there to get you going. There's some notable big exceptions that don't work yet natively. And when I say don't work yet natively, I mean, you probably should just avoid doing this altogether if your job relies on this. Android Studio, SQL Server, MySQL Workbench will work through translation. It's, it's okay. And same thing with SQL Server Management Studio. They both work. There's gonna be a little bit of a lag, but they'll get you through. Notion works, but it is the x64 version and the translation is working pretty well for that one git for windows surprisingly doesn't have an arm version yet but how much do you really do with git anyway inside wsl2 git already comes pre-installed and that one is the arm version and if you're doing virtualization outside of docker or wsl if you want to run a package like vmware or virtualbox you're out of luck now how far does the translation layer take you well it'll do avx instructions right now but it won't do AVX2. And I found this out by copying the X64 version of Geekbench, the binaries, over to the ARM machine, and it just exploded, gave me an error saying AVX2 is not supported. What is AVX? It's Advanced Vector Extensions. It's a C++ thing that runs pretty low level that you can leverage as a programmer to optimize your code and make it run faster. Basically, single instruction, multiple data, SIMD. These are operations that can significantly boost performance. AVX2 takes that a little bit further and adds even more instructions and those break now there's also packages like uh, blender for example blender is currently an alpha in its arm version but there is the x64 version of blender that you can run on these machines and it does run the time for rendering the bmw demo is uh, not that much faster using the native arm version than using the translated x64 version so we're going to get a mixed bag of results depending on the software package that you're running after the graphics driver update i did check geekbench that's the gpu test and the score did not go up so then i wondered is blender using the gpu or what's going on here and sure enough Blender was not using the GPU. And that would explain the similar render times I got for before the graphics driver update and after the driver update. What about games? I haven't gamed too much in the last many years, but I was curious about how games are gonna respond on these machines because some reviews out there were showing that the graphics driver was not performing very well here. And after updating to the latest beta graphics driver, Doom Eternal actually launched and it played pretty smoothly. I was pretty impressed, even though my gameplay it was uh, pretty embarrassing but overall the experience was pretty smooth and I was able to play for an embarrassing amount of time. Again, I'm embarrassed. I played for two hours straight on battery without power plugged in on the X Plus machine and I had plenty of juice left over, which is pretty amazing. Now I do have the 512 gigabyte models here, but these machines are upgradable. You can pop these feet off apparently. Oh, yeah. Look at that, the foot just comes right off. There's a screw there. And 
there's an M.2 slot that you can just upgrade. That's not something you can say about the MacBooks, of course. So what's so good about the new X Elite and X Plus machines? Well, there are some things that are better on it, some things that run faster on it, like Visual Studio, those workflows. But there's other development tasks that don't run in any usable way, like Android Studio. IntelliJ with Java works quite well. You just need to get the right version of Java, the ARM version of the JDK. So it's a kind of a mixed bag. I'd say the biggest win for these new machines is definitely the battery life, especially when this machine can outlast the MacBook Air. If you're doing web development, you're golden. If you're doing Python development, you're good. If you're doing .NET, you're good. So for some of you, it's gonna be a no-brainer to get one of these. For others, it's gonna be a risky move. And for the rest of you, the safe bet would be to get an Intel-based machine, but you're gonna have to be plugged in most of the time. Check out these models and a bunch of other machines I tested in a battery test right over here. And again, thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.